to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 43 of the Leo Training Podcast. This week's guest is Andrew Reed. Andrew has a wealth of experience and has been in the training game a long time. He is a former master RKC and currently teaches for functional movement systems. Andrew also owns and operates his own facility, Reed Performance Training, in Victoria, Australia. In this interview, Andrew and I discuss some of the latest and most popular trends in the fitness and health industry, including high in it intensity interval training, and particularly why this may may not be a good mode of exercise for the vast majority of the population. One of the major themes that will be discussed throughout this interview is placing your health before fitness, and we will touch on the most important lifestyle factors that you need to account for before you set foot into the gym and focus on your training. So without further ado, Health Before Fitness with Andrew Reed. Andrew Reed, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your uh, busy morning to come on to the show. That's all right. Nice to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, having you on, and, and we've got some great topics in store uh, for the audience. Uh, for those that are not familiar uh, with you, I know you're, you're located in Australia, um, but I would love for you to take a couple of minutes and introduce yourself and provide a little bit of background and sort of uh, your uh, you know, entry point and in, in career in the uh, strength and conditioning and coaching field. Uh, let's see. Started martial arts very young. So started when I was about 10 because I was unruly and lacked discipline and my parents thought it would be a good idea for me. Um, that's been a, a constant. So I started at 10. I'm 45 and I, I still train. I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu now. Uh, was not I, – I went through puberty late and at the same time this is like Conan the Barbarian was coming out and, and Terminator and – and I remember thinking, like, you know, like if I was big and strong like that, I'd be even better at this kicking people business. <laughs> and uh, so I started getting into lifting weights, would read bodybuilding magazines because that was actually about the only information that was around. And got lucky when I did. Uh, so, you know, I realized very quickly that um, I don't have a frame that's built for mass gain. Uh, so for people who don't know what it look like, I'm, I'm just over six foot tall I'm about 185 pounds and look like I, I should be swimming, which funnily enough, I was also pretty good at as a kid. Um, but it was like, you know, I, instead of getting big, I'll just I'll get stronger for sport and because I, I, I got to compete in a weight class anyway, so I don't need to get any bigger. So I started looking at – already I was like, what was I, like 19 or 20 and, and was starting to think about sport-specific stuff, which in Australia is – we don't have the same setup that the US does in terms of the high school and collegiate system. So very unlikely to get organized strength and conditioning until you basically make it as a pro. And even then, depending on the sport, maybe you won't get, you know, like every day, maybe you only get, you know, like during the season or just pre-season or, you know, they wouldn't have year round access to professional strength and conditioning in a lot of cases. And then got really lucky because when I went and did the Australian, so we have the ASCA, which is like the NSCA, uh, went and did one of their courses, and this guy Ian King was the he was the head of the ASCA then, and I saw he was going to run a workshop in Melbourne not long after I did that, and so signed up. And at the time, this guy, for people who don't know their strength history, Ian King's the most copied guy in strength and conditioning. So rep tempo, that was him. Uh, if you look at the original paper, him and Poliquin wrote it together. Uh, single limb training, he was talking about single limb training in 94 I think when I first met him which was five years before Mike Boyle started talking about it um so just got lucky met this really smart intuitive guy early on and uh that kind of shaped a lot of the stuff I was I was looking at uh then got into uh looking at some Paul Czech stuff not the crazy stuff but he was talking about 
stability and core and all this kind of stuff 20 years before everybody else. And I was working in a place where they, and this is how old I am. I, I remember my first day in this gym, I turned up and they went, you need to go and watch these VHS tapes. So, <laughs> so I sat there for about a week and I watched this, and I can't remember how many tapes it was, but it was basically my entire week's worth of work was sitting there watching these tapes and taking notes on, you know, like those, those tiny little fat TVs with like the, you know, there's about six pixels on the screen. So all the pictures are crappy and, right. uh, and you know, like no, PowerPoint didn't exist and you know, the presentations were terrible. And, and, uh, but, but he was talking about stuff that now people are wrapping their heads around better. So I, I got lucky because very early on, I had someone talk to me about single limb training and stability and not stability on like on unstable surface, but actually creating stability uh, from, let's say, an unstable position, if that makes sense. So one leg from split stance. Um, then you get companies like FMS coming along. And the FMS strength side of things is very much about creating core stability and you use a bunch of, uh, let's call them foundational positions, so lying, kneeling, and quadruped to build your standing position. And I'm just lucky because I've been doing it for 20 years. So uh, I was kind of in the right place at the right time. And now when I look at how we train, it's all based on this stuff that I just got lucky to find 20 years ago. And it just so happens that now everyone's caught up to these two guys and they've refined things as they've gotten to understand things better. And uh, But very much all based on Ian King and Paul Check from, from a long time ago. Very cool. Yeah, I've... Um... I've read uh, Paul Check's Movement Movement Matters, uh, a very short book, probably only like 50, 60 pages, and then um, working my way through his, uh, I guess he calls it the pr- primitive primitive patterns, or primal, primal patterns. Um, he's got like an online digital digital course now. But yeah, that's that's very interesting. I, I had not heard of Ian King uh, until you had mentioned him, so I'll, I'll be sure to check him out. Ian is, I'm not even kidding when I say this, the most copied guy in strength and conditioning. Like, if, he, if there was a prize for being most plagiarized, he would sadly hold it. So, wow. uh, I mean, he's pre- pretty much gotten to the point now where, um, unfortunately, he's so bitter about the amount of plagiarism that's gone on that he barely does anything now. He, he just kind of does his own thing. Uh, he runs some events in the US, not many. And just he's happy to do his own thing, work with his athletes, get great results, and not get ripped off. Right, right. Um, so Andrew, so one of the one of the first topics we we had down, or actually, uh, um, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed after looking over your website is the approach that you take at, at Reed uh, Performance Training, um, and you talk a lot about being the you know sort of the one percent of the fitness industry. And one of the other things that caught my eye in the video of your facility is uh, there's tons and tons of open space, and you you make the remark that it's um, you know proudly kind of a, a homage to um, the traditional uh, you know gymnasiums back in the early 19th century. Yeah, the Turner Halls, man. Like, yep. uh, for people who know their exercise history, this group of German people came over there, and they called them the Turners, and they had these. And if you if you just go and like Google and you, you type in like old gymnasiums, you'll see pommel horses and ropes and all this stuff, but mostly you'll see open space. And it, as the time goes along more and more, what you see is the ropes go. They had uh, like both high and low pommel horses. The high ones go. Um, there ends up being more stuff in there. So you can already see very early on like equipment starting to come in and you know, all of a sudden we're sitting down all the time. Uh, we move a lot less, but it was the it was the early gyms where people were moving well. So we don't need to go back to you know living in like the depression kind of era. Right. But, but you know, like most of our customers when they come in, they're like, oh, you know, where's all the equipment? I'm like, you're the equipment, mate. Like, you know, I've got everything I need right there. And when we add in, you know, we've got some bars and some kettlebells and. We've got pull-up bars, a couple other little bits and pieces. But honestly, if for most people, and well, even at elite level, I mean, I had guys not for the Rio Olympics. I actually didn't have anyone for the Rio Olympics, but I had a guy riding the Tour de France this year. Um, Very cool. 
Yeah, I mean, and didn't need any extra equipment. But I had uh, five, se- sorry, seven people in five sports at the London Olympics, and I trained them all with in a space that was sixty square meters. That's like about six hundred square feet. And I had some kettlebells. I had two pull-up bars. I had an FMS kit, and I had a single barbell with up to one hundred and forty kilo of weight. So you can do just about anything if you know what you're doing with your stuff. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know this, obviously I'm not creating world-class power lifters or Olympic lifters with that stuff, but even like rowing, cycling, uh, I had a guy who pitched for the major leagues. He pitched for the Braves. Uh, I mean, if, if you know what you're doing and, and it's not a pure strength sport, even field events like hammer shot, that kind of thing, probably wouldn't be able to help them with, I need more heavy weight, but for everybody else, I, I got you covered with what we got. Yeah, no, I love that. I love the you, uh, you know, sticking and, and focusing on the basics and the fundamentals and utilizing wide open space. And um, you know, you have you have all the tools you need. You can pretty much cover everything you need with with those three: body weight, kettlebell, and, and the barbell. Yeah, well, and, and even like the movement stuff. So crawling is in vogue. Um, you know, you got let's see, movement restoration project, Brandon Hetzler and uh, Jeff O'Connor. So that they're doing great stuff. Then you got original strength, Tim Anderson, Jeff Newport. There's some crawling based stuff in FMS because we talk about crawling and rolling patterns. Um, but sure, crawling's in vogue. All my customers think crawling is like a fitness exercise. I'm like, no, it's a plank. You guys like, I just have, rather than tell you to hold a plank for a minute, I can make you crawl for a minute. You've still got to hold everything all locked up. I just happen to be producing force at either end of your spine and you're having to deal with it. So it's kind of like a plank on steroids, for lack of a better term. But you know, my customers see one thing, but the reality is they're doing extra core work. So the the a lot of the movement stuff is really A, they need to move more, but B, it's a sneaky way to get them to do more of the stuff that I actually want them to do. Like you know, because left to their own devices, most people would probably deadlift. Um, in my gym, they'd want to like race on the rowing machines or the air dines or something. You can do, go nuts, do that as much as you want. That's the dessert. But over here, here's your vegetables. Eat your vegetables first, and then you can do whatever you want. You, you can do bicep curls till the cows come home. I don't care. But over here, we're going to do some crawling. We're going to do some half kneeling stuff. We're going to do some get ups. We're going to stretch a lot, and then you can do, go do whatever you want. You can have a bicep curl air dine race. I don't care. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. That's good. And and I like how you um you phrase that you like, you know, it's a sneaky way of getting it in cuz sometimes it's all about how you present it to the individual. It is. It is. It's that's the it's the magical part. It's here's the customer they come in and say, "I want blah blah blah. I want X Y and Z." And okay, I I get that, but you don't even have ABC yet. So I'm going to try I'm going to show you that, that we're doing XYZ. But I'm working on ABC the whole time, you know. And, and we talked about this, you and I, before we started. You know that the FMS performance pyramid. You know, people are coming in yes. and they want to work on. And, and I had a guy this week, so he's uh, he's in his forties, was a smoker, never great history of exercise, and he's done really well over the last two years. He's been with us now for most of the year. He ran his first ten k on the weekend. And he's really doing great. And he signed up for a beginner triathlon. It's quite short. It's like 510.5 or something or maybe two. I can't remember what the run is. But he, he's got that, right? He's got the distance, no problem. Um, but he, he's like, oh, well, you know, I really want to be able to do like like a special triathlon training program. I'm like, but you can't even do 10 push-ups. Like, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you're not a triathlete. Like, you're just doing one triathlon that's in six weeks. Like, and, and you know, you, you're not going to win it anyway. So let's just concentrate on on ABC before we worry about X, Y, Z. And luckily he's, because he is in his 40s, he actually will listen, whereas a lot of people would at some point leave because they're like, well, you know, I want to do box jumps and burpees and well, you probably don't need that stuff. Right, right. I, I was just going to ask, but you, you gave his reaction. That's And, and, and I can appreciate like how uh, – Really, just how blunt you are. You just tell it like it is. <laughs> like this is what you need to do. Really, not you don't need to be over here. Just stick with ABC, like you said. Well, you know, like I've probably never been very tactful, and as I get older, I'm less tactful. Um, <laughs> but but the, the reality is, look, I don't get much time with people. I get three, maybe four hours a week. If you're a fantastic client, I might get five or six hours a week. 
Um, but the number of like five or six plus hour a week people I have, it's like two or three. Like I don't have many of those. Right. So I have a really limited time to make as much difference as I can. And in some cases, that's going to mean having a go at you about what you eat. In other cases, it's going to be saying, hey, man, like, you know, I know you want to deadlift or whatever, but let's be honest, like, you're overweight. The, the number one thing and, and your number one risk is having a heart attack. The best thing I can do for you actually is some cardiovascular activity. Um, and as boring as that's going to be, that's what the thing you need the most is. So rather than waste their time and have these kind of flowery conversations and beat around the bush, I'm just going to go straight to the point. I get an hour at a time, a couple of times a week. I don't have time for, for fancy sentences and, and pats on the head. And, and, and we even, all my customers know, I, I have a saying that I won't pr- praise mediocrity at my gym. Right. So we're not pandering to your bullshit. I don't care if you get upset by what I say because at the end of the day, you hired me to perform a service and sometimes that's going to mean that you know your ego takes a bit of a hit, right? Right. Without being, I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not a bastard about it, but you know, that's just the the nature of the thing. And it's, you know, I know you come from a, a sport coaching background. It's always interesting to me looking at the difference in mentality between athletes and normal people. See, a, a good athlete, one who wants to be great, will take on board any criticism. You tell me I suck, like give it to me, man. I want to eat that up because I, I want to take that thing I suck at and I want to own it. I'm going to improve that and I know it's going to make me better. Like tell me, like any little problem, even if it's like a 0.1 per second difference, like tell me, tell me, tell me. Yep. A normal person, you go, you know, like let's say, uh, and because you're a rowing guy, they yes. were, they, they, they row 2K, right? So that's kind of 7, 715 for a normal person is a great benchmark. Mm-hmm. So let's say they row 8 the first time. And they, the next time it comes up in a program, they row 740 or something. But I think they're good for a 730. I'm not patting them on, but they'll get, hey, that, that's great. You did well. But 730 was the goal. Um, I had a guy who his goal and last week, his goal was 720 or better. He did a 721.9. Oh, what, do you think, what, do you think he, what do you think he's doing this week? He's doing the row again. Yeah. So the goal is the goal. Uh, and, and he's good. Like he, he took it on board and he's like, you're right. You know, I know I can do better. Um, and when we looked at where he, he, he broke mentally <laughs> with about 700 to go. <laughs> um, and, but you know, like, but then he was like, you know, I haven't eaten very well today and I've been a bit stressed with work. And so it forced him to go away and look at all the things that could be improved. So I've got every confidence that when he does it again, we'll knock that final 1.9 seconds off and then we can move on. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it's always interesting watching the difference between how athletes take feedback because it's not it's not criticism. It's just, hey, you can do this better. Yep. And a normal person, and a normal, we're so soft around the edges now. A normal person, we are. We, we are. We get, it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's like, true. Oh, I, I didn't get a pat on the head and a medal just for turning up. Oh, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and so you give that feedback to people and they don't know how to deal with it anymore. Yeah, it, it's not it, it's not encouraging that that's the uh, cultural or societal norm at this point. Well, it, it's this misunderstanding of, and I think maybe you know Jocko Willink, the, the ex Navy SEAL guy who's doing like some leadership stuff, and he's got a podcast now. And oh, I think I no, think I he had a thing. On, I'm pretty sure he had a thing saying like motivation's bullshit. It's all about discipline because at some point you know you won't have your motivational poster or you won't have your the special music or you know, like there's no one there to cheer you on, but you still got to do the work. Right. You know, that's right. And, the, and, and the thing that's going to get you to do the work is not like some rah-rah speech. It's, it's this inner desire. And, you know, people I think have become so focused on that extrinsic motivation that they forget that, hey, this is supposed to be coming from inside you. So at my gym, we have no mirrors, no music. Um, and everyone's like, well, like, oh, you know, it'd be so much easier to, to row faster with that. I was like, do you have a soundtrack for your life? Like if the zombies come, <laughs> uh, is like, they, is there going to be a Rocky montage to help you run away? Like when, when the shit hits the fan, you're on your own. That's you right. better figure out how to make that happen on yeah. your own. So we try to take away all that stuff um, to help people find that because often they got so many voices in their head, it can be hard to let them be quiet. Yes, that's a great point. That's a great point. And uh, I, I used to train when I was younger 
in college in my uh, 20s and stuff, I used to I used to train with music, uh, and I I rarely do now. Um, sometimes I, I do, but most of the time, um, whether it's like strength training or or uh, endurance work, rowing wise, I, I really try to listen more to my body now. Um, well, that's probably and because you did SF, SFG, that's one of the great things about those courses is is they really make sure you understand how detailed the form should be, how much focus is required. Um, the thing that drew me to the kettlebell thing initially was how martial it is in its application, like form absolutely matters. And, and my lifting form was good before, but I would suggest now it's it's not perfect, obviously, because we've all got stuff. Um, but for my frame, for my injuries, for where I'm at, uh, my form is is pretty damn good, and if you came and looked at our customers, you'd see the same thing. So um, when you have music, and it, as I said, I mean most people got so many voices going on in their head when you added like Britney or whatever, like singing along. <laughs> no, no, but I mean they they can barely get. Let's say a set of swings. Let's say out of ten swings, they do six good ones. Right. We had Britney, and maybe it's four, maybe it's three. Like so, now we've got to do more to get the same effect or we could just really focus and do the bare minimum we have to, which means we've got to take away some of the distraction because if you add Brittany in, we're going to have to do more swings because now you're actually only really doing half the number every set. Right. Yeah. And, and we've, we've diluted the quality of the, uh, of the set. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I mean, and that's, you know, when people are like, Oh, you know, I tried working out. It really didn't do anything. And, and I wrote this post on Facebook yesterday. I was like, well, have, have you actually tried trying, like really made an effort and to cut the distraction away? And, you know, because I guess people think they're going to get an extraordinary result from their ordinary effort. And that's not what extraordinary means. I mean, it means we, we've got to go beyond what we've done previously. So, you know, if you can't lose weight, if you're not running as fast as you wish you could, if you're not lifting as heavy, but you keep doing the same plan, like what the hell's wrong with you? Like you do the same thing, you'll get the same result. Like that's the definition of insanity, right? That's right. I remember, uh, and I won't name names, but uh, the Iron Maiden, which is in the RKC SFG, so it's a press, a pistol, and a pull-up with a 24-kilo kettlebell for females. For the men, it's a 48. This is, this is quite a hard challenge because the three lifts don't really complement one another. The body types required are different. Um, and this one girl, she got close, got injured, got close, got injured, got close, missed it, got close, got injured, two years. And I remember saying to her after like the third or fourth attempt, like, what, what are you going to do now that you've, you've missed? And she said, oh, I'll just go back to my training plan and, and, you know, start again. I'm like, why? It fucking hasn't worked for two years. Like, why, why, why would you waste another two years? It wasn't actually till another person who I won't name came along and said and, and really just slapped her and, and said, you know, don't be stupid. Do this instead. Magically a month later she nailed it. Wow. Yeah. But she she'd just been just bubbling along with her ordinary program, with her ordinary effort, and someone a bit more experienced came along and said, this is the thing. So um yeah. And it's interesting. And in the meantime, I'd trained two people to do the beast uh, the Iron Maiden in the same period of time. And this one, this one girl was still just just going along, exactly the same. Like nothing had changed. You you've authored uh, the book Beast Tamer, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, so that was uh, Val Headland was the first one, and then Beth Andrews was the second one. So uh, Val actually was the person who prompted the writing of the book to begin with, and then because the I don't know if you've ever written a book, but from writing it to having it printed is not it's not overnight. You know, there's there's some stuff in between. It was nearly a two-year process. So, um, uh, and I, I remember actually the I had sent the book, just the the rough copy. I was actually going to write it as an ebook and sell it myself. Um, I sent it to John Duquesne and hadn't heard anything for a couple of weeks. I was like, well, I guess John didn't like it, you know. But, and, and, right. I, and I, okay. but I wasn't actually asking him to print it. I, I was just going like, hey, man, you've got a lot of experience with publishing. What, what do you think? Like, is this okay? And I woke up on the morning of my 40th birthday 
And this is how I, I mean, it's easy to remember that, right? And I had an email from John Duquesne and Pavel telling me how great it was and that Dragon Door were going to print it. And by the way, here's the contract. And then it was like another year or so before it actually got published. So, you know, there's a, a fair process between writing it and, and actually coming out. And in that gap, uh, Beth was really close to the Iron Maiden and helped her and, and she got that too. So, yeah, I mean, it was interesting watching, you know, this other girl fail and fail and fail. And in the same period of time, I'd helped a couple of people do it. So, you know, she just wasn't willing to change what she was doing. Yeah. If, you, if the plan's not working, you got you to gotta make a change, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'd be like, like, you know, like you go run against Usain Bolt. Oh, I'm going to beat him this time. Really? Like, what makes <laughs> you think that? You know, like, it's exactly the same as last time. Like, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Got to, got to, got to look at the results and make a, make a change and, you know, evaluate your plan and see what can be done differently. I mean, that's, yeah. and that's, that's just that's part what, of being uh, an athlete. It is, but that's where the coach comes in because often yep. you can be so tied into what you're doing, you lack objectivity. You know, you're. That's an excellent just, point. This, excellent this is a hundred percent the thing for me. Maybe it's not. Maybe actually you're better off. At, like, and I look at um, strength training is a great example. So FMS have this thing called the FCS that's coming out, the functional capacity screen. Yes. So it's basically for strength training, or let's say performance training, what the FMS is for movement base. That's really clever. Like I, I've had a look at it. Uh, I've had an opportunity to actually do a couple of the screens on people and kind of see what's what, how it fits. Um, it makes programming very simple. So uh, the very first time I saw it, we had this guy who – and so the, the power test is a standing broad jump, and the baseline is your height. So if you can't jump your height, you need some basic force production training. Go lift heavy. If you jump further than your height, we know your problem's not force production. Your power to weight ratio is adequate. And the first time I saw it, this guy who we actually ran it on, uh, he was like, oh, well, you know, I need to work on this. And, and it was always like squat deadlift kind of questions. And all of a sudden, we're like, yeah, but that's not your problem. Your problem's over here. Your problem is, is elasticity. Your problem is reusing energy and motor control. And so what do you think is going to be in his program? It's not going to be more – I mean, he'll, he'll have some squat and deadlift, but – He's already on the force velocity curve. He's already maximized that side. So now actually his best gains athletically are going to be on the speed side. And not many people, you know, they think they're training speed in the gym. They're not really. I don't, I don't see anyone doing med ball throws. I don't see anyone. I mean, maybe they do wall balls. It's not the same thing. Um, uh, maybe they're doing box jumps, but they're not really doing speed, like the stretch shortening cycle stuff. They're not really doing speed related jump training. Uh, and so what a surprise no one's any good at it. Right. Yeah. If you're not, well, if you're and, not doing it, and you're it, not going to get that. And I hate to throw kettlebells under the bus because I love them so much, but yeah, everyone's like, oh, the swing, the swing, the swing, the swing is still too heavy. It's still too slow compared to jumping. So, I mean, the swing is closer to the straight, it's closer to the jump side, the unloaded side than it is to the heavy deadlift side, but it's still too heavy and slow compared to jumping. You'll always jump with faster joint angle changes than you will with, with swings. So it still isn't close enough to get you that speed benefit. Wow. Mm. And you like the triple extension, but that's another thing. Okay. Good points. That's great points right there. Um, before we forget, because you mentioned this a couple, couple of minutes back. So one of the, one of the things that we, we talked about before we got on air was you would, if, if you could, you would throw in another layer under uh, oh, yeah. the FMS pyramid. And you, so under movement, you would actually put as the sort of the baseline would be lifestyle um so what do you mean by that and why would you put lifestyle underneath movement so just for people who don't know so the performance pyramid has skill or like sports specific skill on top so this is i don't know like ball handling drills it's kicking for soccer it's actual sport training then underneath you've got base strength and conditioning so that's the stuff that as strength coaches we're very good at that's how to make someone fitter and stronger that's actually quite easy under that you've got base movement skills uh, and motor control, so proprioception, mobility, and stability is pretty typical of what people look at in there. But underneath all that, like you can have the best training program in the world with a body that looks like it's primed and ready to go, but if you're getting four hours sleep and eating bad food, nothing matters because you're not actually going to be primed to absorb the training because when we put the training stress into the body, you actually need to be able to adapt to it. So it's entirely possible to train too hard 
and not get an adaptation or not hard enough and not get an adaptation. If you've already put yourself in an overly stressed state by not sleeping or eating adequately uh, or having a lot of family stress or your parents are going through a divorce, like all this kind of stuff that adds stress to our life, there's no way you can train well. So the lifestyle stuff, I joke about it. I, I say it's beer, booty, and burgers. So <laughs> if, if you're drinking all the time, probably not going to help, right? So it doesn't matter if your program was designed by a rocket scientist and you've got like everything else lined up, but you're drinking alcohol every day, not going to work. If you are eating bad food, burgers every day, probably not going to work. And finally, if you're out chasing booty every night till one or two o'clock in the morning, because then you're not sleeping, probably not going to help. So, you know, the lifestyle stuff, we want to minimize the impact of the beer, booty, and burgers. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying minimize it. Uh, it actually puts you in a position to absorb more training stress. So, you know, when, when I look at um, people like me, people often wonder how I can train so much still. Like I'm 45. I'm still training 15 to 20 hours a week. Um, simple. I go to bed at 9. I get up at 5. I get 8 hours sleep every night. I'm lucky in a sense because of my job. Often it's quite quiet in the middle of the day. I can usually squeeze a little nap in there. Um, there's a lot of advantages in that sense, but I eat well. I don't drink. I haven't drunk now since April 2012, um, and that wasn't – it's not like a moral choice. I, I don't think alcohol is good or bad. It just didn't fit in with getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, right. at, at, well, you know, people are paying me to be – as tactless and as blunt as I can be, they're still paying me to be at least a little smiley at first thing in the morning. So turning <laughs> grumpy and hungover is not part of that package. So I realized that as far as work went, it really didn't fit. Um, and so I, I got to say though, I'm kind of maxed out for like my lifestyle stuff. I get out of sleep, I get a nap, I eat well, uh, don't drink. Like I'm, I'm doing, I don't take drugs. I'm, you know what I mean? Like there, there are no more improvements to be made. From yeah, that thing. you've um, checked all the boxes. Yeah, yeah. But when you are of moderate athletic ability and you're athletically old, like 45 as an athlete, is that's like 200. It's like dog years. Um, <laughs> you know, like, if you make the choice that you want to stay athletic and active, you choose an active lifestyle, which means you have to make some of these sacrifices or you choose – not to, and that's okay because you know there, there's no right or wrong here. This is the, the decisions only you can make about your life. Um, but I chose that I want to be active. I, I want to stay as active and, and adventurous and athletic as possible for as long as possible. My goal at forty is to arrive at fifty in the same shape I am now, and then to get to sixty like I was at fifty, and so on and so on. Um, and the only way to do that is go to bed early, get your sleep, train regularly. Um, you know, that's the only way. But but Andrew, it's that's not like the sexy answer everybody's looking for. Well, it's it's not. That's the thing, you know. Like I, I was saying to my mum this morning. So I, I trained my mum. She's seventy four. She's actually a world record holder in the deadlift. Um, that, yeah, we go. That's we awesome, go, man. That is awesome. We go, we go to the world championships in Louisiana in just a few weeks. So um, if she, we've been to the world champs before when it was in Sydney, but she tore her hamstring on her first lift, so we didn't even get a lift on the board. So she's world record holder, but not world champion. Um, it is, I got to say, there's not too many 70 year old women wanting to go in a powerlifting competition. So it's not like she's turning up and there's 100 people to beat, but you can still only compete against the people who want to turn up. But I, I was training her this morning. We were joking about basically this shitstorm I started on Facebook accidentally yesterday by saying, walk more often, eat less garbage. And people really got offended by it. I was like, you know. A, it's simple advice. Like I don't think anyone should be arguing with that. But uh, my mum said, oh, you know, you can make a fortune selling. No, you can't. It's not sexy at all. Walk more and eat less shit. How am I going to make a – that's not P90X. I gotta, we got to shred. we gotta, we got to go for the burn. You know, we gotta, we got to do something extreme. And it's the same reason passive stretching doesn't get a big rap. Steady state cardio doesn't – because you can't make money off it. How are you going to make money off telling somebody to go for a run for an hour? There's nothing to be made there. Yeah, it's not. It's not fun. Uh, it's. It takes time. It takes consistent effort. It does. But yeah. uh, if you want lasting adaptation, all that stuff—the walking, the steady state cardio, the not eating bad food, the going to sleep early, the maximal strength work, 
the the passive flexibility, like the relaxed stretching stuff, all that stuff creates lasting change. I mean, you can find kids who are dancers or gymnasts at eight to ten years old who are still not far off the splits because of the the stretching they did when they were kids. You can find swimming is a great example. You can find someone who swam as a kid, hasn't been in the pool for 10 years, who will still smoke you just based on what they learned from it as a kid. Um, you know, the lasting changes are all from the hard things, the things you've got to have the discipline to do. Nothing good and lasting is coming from three 30-minute workouts a week. I don't care how hard you work. If you want a big result, you're going to need to put in a lot of time. And that's, again, it's not sexy. You can't sell it. Um, the average number of hours that an elite athlete trains is 15 to 18 each week. Yeah, they do. Uh, they oh, put in a ton uh, of time. A ton. Well, I would actually suggest that's probably on the low end. Yeah, uh, I, I, would, that, I was going to probably say probably the, 25 the to 30. Yeah, I, I particularly like the, the non-impact athletes like swimming, rowing, cycling, probably way more. Uh, I would think rowers, uh, runners, sorry, uh, that 15 to 18, maybe things like rugby and, and things like that, like where there's some impact. But I mean, swimmers, swimmers are going to swim more than 15 hours a week. Like you can find 10 year old kids swimming that much. Yep. So, you know, and, and if you want the, the change, that's, that's what's going to happen. The, I think it's the Norwegians have this magic formula for determining elite success. It's 275210. Two sessions a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for 10 years. Get through that. And A, if you get through that, we know mentally you've probably got what it takes, right? Because you're disciplined enough to have done the work. But B, it's only when you've done all that and you've got that really solid base, now we'll figure out if physiologically you can handle what's needed to go to the very top. You'll be very good either way. But maybe you won't make it to the absolute top, right? Right, yeah. but you'll be you'll be in the mix, probably. Yeah, but two two seven fifty two ten. Go do that, then come back and talk to me. So you know my, that wipes out most people straight away. Right, that's cool. Um, yeah, and, and look at like I mean again my my client who's doing this. Uh, I've got a client doing a beginner triathlon in a couple of weeks, and he's doing three sessions a week. I'm like. You're probably going to want at least more swims than that. He's like, why? I said, well, you haven't swum since you were a kid and the swim start is pretty hectic if you haven't been to triathlon before. Even like this little triathlon he's going to do is a – it'll be a mosh pit at the start because you'll have a bunch of inexperienced people trying to beat the snot out of each other at the start of the swim. Um, And like the panic from that, it's just you want to be comfortable in the water. So maybe a couple more swims. And he runs actually quite well. And I was like, well, maybe – Maybe a couple of extra bike sessions as well. So, you know, I, I've kind of talked him up from three sessions a week for triathlon to six sessions a week, so two of each sport. And if he likes it and he's keen on this triathlon thing, once he's gotten through this and he gets a little bit more serious, we'll bump him up to nine, <laughs> three of each each week, and, and then, then we can start getting a little bit serious. <laughs> but till then, I'm like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the truth, though. You have to, you have to put in the time. Um, you know, if you're not willing to put in the time, you're, you can't expect really good results. It's just, yeah. it's not, I mean, it's not re- realistic. We have, uh, so Spartan race in Australia is, it's kind of seasonal. Uh, so we're coming into Spartan season now because we're coming into summer. So there's one coming up in uh, like a month and it's, it's a super sprint and beast all on the same weekend. So it's a seven, 14 and 21 kilometer race all on the same weekend. If you wanted to do all three, um, and the 14 is probably the most popular distance. And people are like, oh, well, it's only 14 kilometers. And that's like nine miles, I think, to people who work in not the metric system. And uh, there's 28 obstacles. So it's like an obstacle every 500 meters. So I'm only going to run 500 meters at a time. I can do that. There's still 14 kilometers of running. So it, it, And I know when we do them with clients, uh, the people who – and you can tell. By the time you get to the back third of the course, there's a lot of people walking. And meanwhile, my customers who've been forced to go out into the hills and run trails for two hours, walking up and down hills and stuff like that on Sundays to get ready for their 14-kilometer Spartan race, um, just keep chugging along. And so it might not be the fastest runners, but they're able to keep going. And you can tell, like the people who thought they could get by with not much running, you can see them. You can see them from about the halfway point. Right. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I mean, and it's completely separate, but I always joke with people about how all you got to do with Iron Man, for instance, if I want to see what you really look like as a runner, I want to see your compensations. I'm going to go to the 30 kilometer mark of the Iron Man marathon. I'm going to see. I don't care what you tell me about your running style. I'm going to see for myself exactly where you're good and where you're bad. Right. Yeah, because that's when you're, so much oh, yeah. fatigue set in. Fatigue, yeah. Like, like your compensations will be so big and so obvious that I, I will see for sure what's wrong with your running. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so there's a couple things that you, you mentioned, uh, again, a couple minutes back. And these actually tie into several uh, blog articles you've you've authored recently. Um, so just a couple of those titles, and I'll make sure I include these in the show show notes. So, uh, big man cardio primer, seventy um, percent multiplied by the eighty twenty uh, rule Pareto's principle, uh, talking Tabata, um, and then how to lift weights faster for for maximum effect. So, I guess the first thing is. Um, addressing one why it's important to be doing lower intensity um cardiovascular work for the for the health benefit and that was that was something that you had pointed out to me and um it's an excellent point and an important one um because it's we're not trying to focus on the cardio centric part of it we're trying to focus on the the health uh yeah. benefit yeah well i mean but that's that bottom layer of the pyramid right like everyone wants to talk about performance hey you know for people in my age group so that's 44 and above number one risk factor is cardiovascular disease so uh if you care to live longer you're probably going to want to know about your heart being healthy and the amount of time you spend and and and, you know everything and this is an ian king thing actually so the pendulum swings usually are quite big we're not very good at balancing things as humans. We want to, we want extremes. We want black and white, good, bad. We're not very good about being in the middle. Um, we went from a very aerobic centric phase in the seventies with the jogging kind of craze and, you know, Jane Fonda and aerobics as like the big thing to over the last decade, very strength focused. And we've actually lost some of the focus on the aerobic stuff. Uh, some of the adaptations that happened to the heart, with heavy training, it's actually possible. So you, you get, uh, you can basically make your heart bigger and stronger for lack of better phrases. If I want to make it bigger, I need cardiovascular training for that, which is what a surprise, actual heart-based training will make my heart better. You can make it stronger, thicker as well, which actually will happen from strength training because what happens is the, the heart responds to the increase in blood pressure from holding your breath to keep everything tight and safe while you lift heavy. But you think in your head, like if you look at your fist, for instance, and think, well, that is about as big as my heart is. If I make it thicker, it'll grow out. But your heart's hollow to an extent. It's got chambers in it that fill up with blood. What actually happens is the the thickness that you gain in the heart wall actually goes in, not out. So you actually can end up with a smaller and smaller chamber in the heart holding the blood. So you look like a Mack truck on the outside, but you're being fired along by a Prius engine because on the inside, you've got a thimble to to power the whole thing. Um, I actually have a guy I've been working with who, very good powerlifter, has been a previous world champion. He was world record holder at one point. Um, He was not feeling the best, went along to the doctors, and they said, yeah, you're down to 30% heart function. So he spent the last six months walking, uh, cutting wood, uh, not holding his breath. We we set limits on how how heavy he could lift, uh, and the bottom end for rep ranges and things like that. So to force him to be more relaxed when he trains, uh, he's actually off to the specialist next week. But he's dropped thirty kilo. Wow. So yeah, well, obviously, so that and that's a combination of muscle that is no longer getting used as well as because uh, for the super heavyweights being bigger is actually beneficial so he was about 150 kilo he's down to the, like the mid 20s now um he's still a big dude he's only six foot so he's was at 250 or something so he's a big guy um but he was 300 or something so he, he's he's dropped a substantial amount of weight and his heart now is actually operating normally 
uh, as, as in based on what we can tell. I mean, he'll go along and get stress tested at the doctors, but um, even things he said before, so he lives in a, on a rural property and he said he used to take all day to cut the wood for them for, you know, like the next week or whatever. It takes him an hour now. He doesn't need to stop. I mean, wow. you know, and, and, yeah, and so little things like that, you're like, okay, so we're on the right path. Yep. So people people look at, you know, cardio and, oh, well, we should be doing hit, and we, well, you're not going to get the same adaptations from that. And again, if you're 40, you probably want to think about health before you worry about performance. And for a lot of people, you know, they're worrying about this very tip of the pyramid. They're thinking, you know, when they look at research studies, research study might show like, hey, this particular interval workout was good for, you know, X amount of improvement. Well, yes, but that was in trained elite cyclists or something. You know, VO2 is in the 70s already. Like the Tabata thing, I mean, the average VO2 in the Tabata group was already about 60. It was like 58 or 59. That's already a way above standard VO2. That's more than 10% above standard. So those people already were in decent shape and then saw a six-point improvement. And six points improvement is, is massive. But the control group saw the same improvement and didn't have to go through the pain. So, and then that's long term. And the Tabata study is so interesting because in the, um, the control group who just did steady state cardio saw the same improvement in their VO2 over that period of time. They didn't see the anaerobic increase that the Tabata group saw, but they had a subjective measurement of how much did you enjoy training. And the Tabata group were like, fuck ever doing that again. That was terrible. <laughs> um, you know, because for people who, who've actually done a gen, one genuine Tabata session, imagine doing that shit five days a week for six weeks. You would be on the verge of slitting your wrists at the end of it. Like, oh, yeah. you would be absolutely, the only thing keeping you going would be super high levels of discipline because you would be so burnt out from how hard that training is and dreading every single session. So, again, long term, if I want to be 40, 50, 60 and in shape, I can't use Tabata because I'm not going to make it. I'll kill myself before we get there. Yeah. I, isn't, I, it, I, isn't, isn't it way better just to kind of cruise my way there and get the same benefit anyway? Right. And I, Andrew, I would say too, they're, they're not just going to be burnt out mentally, but the that type of that type of intensity, if you're doing it that much on that consistent of a uh, schedule, you're, you're going to fry your adrenal grand, glands. Oh, yeah. Well, well, that's, that's, that's the thing people get. So, so if I want to train, so uh, I can train aerobically or anaerobically. Those are my choices, right? So anything anaerobic, this is lifting weights or interval training uh, and particularly the, the high-intensity interval stuff, which is like my particular bugbear for most people. Uh, or I can train aerobically, steady state, lower heart rate, uh, fat burn. When I train anaerobically, I'm burning a lot of sugar, right? Now, we only store – most people, 1,500 to 1,800 calories of glycogen in the body at any time. Very easy to burn that out, right, in a session. So you burn sugar and your body's got all these really well-regulated mechanisms. So you burn the sugar, your body says, hey, we're low on sugar. Eat some sugar. So unless you're weighing your food, which let's face it, most people aren't, it is going to be impossible for you to get it right to the calorie to replace what you burn. So really easy to overeat, in other words. So next thing you know, you are burning sugar, you're overeating sugar. What do you think happens when you overeat sugar? Oh, you store it as fat. Then because you're eating sugar, burning sugar, you're actually stuck in sugar burning mode. So you're stuck in anaerobic glycolysis. You start burning sugar even when you're sitting still, when you should be working aerobically, your fat burning system is not working. And then your body says, hey, I'm low on sugar, eat some sugar. And so you get this situation where people are working anaerobically just walking around because their aerobic system's fried but it's fried because A, they never work on it, and B, cortisol's high, they're stuck in this sugar-burning mode, and the only way to get out of it is to slow the fuck down. You know? And, and we, we, we start with people, so uh, you know this, this idea of stress management, I talked a little bit before, I've got some clients right now, we're down to, because they're super stressed out, I've had a client go to hospital recently because she's had so much stuff on, uh, PhD, working as a physiotherapist, trying to train as in, in the gym plus some jiu-jitsu, just burn herself to pieces. You know what she gets at the moment? She gets walking and meditation. I mean, we, we've gone right back to let's fix the lifestyle stuff, let's get sleep, let's get food, let's get some vitamin D, and we're not even talking about performance. We're now trying to rebuild the health of someone before we worry about fitness. So we got health, we got fitness, we got performance. If we don't have health, 
you're going to really struggle to add fitness and performance on top. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, 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 I, and the, the, the fitness industry, I mean, we talked about unsexy. You can't package 60 minute aerobic sessions. Imagine hiring a personal trainer to stand next to you on a treadmill for 60 minutes. Can't make money off that. I can totally make money off Fran though, can't I? Right. That's right. That's right. And so, and that, that's the problem. We, we're, we're being marketed to based on what we can sell, not on actually what's beneficial, which, I mean, we all know that's the history of the fitness industry anyway. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't actually think – even P.T. Barnum would blush at the way the fitness industry markets stuff. I mean, you couldn't ask for a group to sell more shoddy merchandise or snake oil than the fitness industry. We're the, the masters of it. You want a fat burner that does nothing? No problem. We got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, – there's – um. I guess there's a those are product for for just about anything you could think of probably at one point or another. Yeah, but but all they're doing, and even you know, like when I look at the business stuff that gets marketed to personal trainers, it's the same. We're just preying on insecurity. So when we offer fat burning to people or six pack abs or all this stuff, it's just based on people's insecurities about how they look, um, and that's media led. Then the personal trainers themselves are being marketed to based on the same sort of stuff because let's face it, the first person that most personal trainers care about training is themselves. So I see them going to workshops and you're like, this isn't, you don't, your clients are 40 years old. What are you doing at like the, the I don't know, the Tabata workshop or something like that? Like, wouldn't you be better off learning, like going to a mobility workshop, figuring out a way to help your clients actually achieve normal ranges of motion so we can actually train productively? But they don't want to do those workshops because the stretching workshops aren't sexy. And then the, for their business stuff, they're being told they need to, uh, geez, have this online platform. They need to buy this product. They need to hook up with this company, and and most of the advice being offered is very basic business stuff, but it's being sold for huge amounts of money because the trainers are being marketed to based on insecurity. So the whole thing is is kind of this ugly, ugly insecurity based marketing, and we all get sucked into it. Yeah, I uh, I've never kind of looked at it quite through that lens but that's that's some excellent insight and perspective well, from somebody that's you, been doing it for a long time well so uh do you know who npe are i'm sorry say it again npe have you heard of them net profit explosion no okay so they're a, a fitness marketing company like a business thing so um they have some good stuff they have this thing called uh i don't even know what it's called anymore but you know it's got multiple modules to it uh, so I did the first module, which was a sales module. I actually found it very helpful. There was some great information in it. And then we got to the next module. And after each module, there's like a little exam, right? And you got to pass the exam so you can go to the next thing. So I did the second module, and they sent me the, the exam actually for level three, not level two. And I did the level three exam, and I, I remember looking through and going like, shit, I, I don't even remember hearing this stuff on the on the, the video and like it's not in the manual and I must have missed something, but well, I'm doing the test, so I'm just going to keep doing the test. I got like 90 something percent. And then I get this email back from them going, oh, look, we accidentally sent you the wrong exam and blah, blah, blah. So now we need you to do level three. I'm like, fuck level three. I already got 90% of the exam. I know that stuff. Like give me level four. And made me realize that this business stuff they were talking about, it was all just common sense. I mean, it's not like I have this magical business background. I'm a, I'm a trainer. I've got some business skills based on running my own business, but I hardly have an MBA or anything like that. And here I am acing their exam without having even seen the material. It made me realize that most of the stuff was common sense. So go through level four, see the same thing, ace the exam. Level five, same thing. I'm like, I don't actually need to see the rest of your stuff. And when I look at everything that's being offered from a business sense to most trainers, It'd just be better off going to Amazon, spending about 50 bucks on books and doing some basic business reading than they would on spending three or four hundred dollars maybe on some of these online training programs and you know, like the business systems. And it's just not necessary, yeah. But that's the uh, like you pointed out, that's the market, right? Like it is, but you know, it, it, it's no different to what you see for regular people as well. So, regular people go online, they want to get in shape and they think they need. I don't know, like if you walk in a gym, what does the gym tell you by how they set the gym up? The gym tells you you need a $10,000 treadmill. In fact, you need 20 of them and you need two of every piece of equipment known to mankind and <laughs> you, don't, you, know, and you need a spa and a pool and you, and, or you could have a pull-up bar and a couple of kettlebells and like a rowing machine, for instance. 
probably, you know, that's about all most people are really going to need. And uh, so, you know, like at our gym, for instance, when people come in and they're like, oh, you know, there's so much space, how are you going to get in shape like this? And uh, let me show you. Come on over here. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we, we market to people based off all that is that you need all this expensive flashy stuff because that's what sells, unfortunately. I mean, if you, if you think when you go in a big gym, what do they got up front? They got their hundreds of thousands of dollars of cardio equipment right up front. You walk in the gym, you go past treadmills and bikes and all that kind of stuff because that's what sells memberships. Right. What doesn't sell memberships is the beast guys down the back deadlifting a house with chalk and heavy metal going everywhere. That's, <laughs> you, don't, you don't sell memberships with that stuff, even though that's the effective stuff. Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. You got to put the stuff up, uh, up front that's going to ha- you know, yeah. drive so, the so aesthetics and the sex appeal. We're all being sucked in. It's, it's an unfortunate part of the industry. Yeah. No, it is. It is. I mean, and like you said, that it, it definitely plays to the, um, the insecurities that, that you know, either trainers or customers have uh, and tries to exploit them. Yeah. And, but, you know, w- when you look at, and we talked about some of the fitness stuff before, like the heart adaptations and all that mm-hmm. stuff, no one's going to tell you that. Because, again, the, the, the gym, they don't want you knowing that you could just go for a run outside. I mean, it, nothing drives me madder than seeing someone drive to the gym to go for a walk on a treadmill. <laughs> you, I, I can't believe people are buying gym memberships to go for a walk. Like, you are aware that's a free thing, but we've got people <laughs> thinking that they need to go to the gym to walk on it. And, and I, look, if you live in a dangerous neighborhood and the only time you can walk is like late at night and – you know, like you're scared of being attacked. Okay, I got that. I totally understand. But for most people who can find a safe place to walk around during the day, you don't need to join a gym to go for a walk. Right. You know, and, and there's so much can be gained with really such common sense stuff. I mean, if you look, fighting is a great example. Like everyone thinks it's super complicated. And I see posts all the time about, oh, you know, fighters don't need steady state cardio and blah, blah, this and blah, blah. I'm going to wager that the first profession was not prostitution. It's not the world's oldest job. Soldier, fighter is the world's oldest job. From the moment we came down from the trees and learned how to throw a rock or swing a club, we've been bashing each other. So history of humankind is filled with conflict nonstop. So as much as we've got some stuff at the moment, it's actually the quietest period in human evolution in terms of wars. Right. Scary, right? Yeah. I mean, like, like, like right now, this is this is actually relatively peaceful as far as humankind is concerned. Um, we've figured it out. We've been doing this for six hundred and fifty thousand years. So, uh, if you look at what fighters have done, they do body weight stuff. Maybe they pick up a heavy rock or something. So we need some strength stuff in there. They run they do a cardio. lot. They run a lot, right? Because because yeah, I mean, if you looked at like the Roman legionnaires, they would row. You know, like they row their big trireme boats and then probably march carrying their bronze armor and whatever, fight, and then have to walk to the next battle. You know, and, and if you look at their average rations, it wasn't much. So, you know, we, uh, we have this idea that we need all this fancy stuff with this perfect programming. And what we really need is some application and some discipline. Yeah. And just, and just, you know, you got to put the time in the trenches. And like, I, I think the other thing too, uh, goes along exactly with what you're saying is like don't expect results to come so quickly it, it takes time yeah well you know, i always laugh with and, and you've you've done sfg so you and you train people with kettlebells right i do yeah so so i always love when you know, like you get someone we're about to do swings they do like two and they turn and they go how was that it's two do like do 10 do a thousand come back to me like you know like right now if we try to change a lot of stuff you don't actually have an experience that we can draw from. You actually need some reps in the bank. So when I say, you know, when you do, like you stand up and the bell's doing this, like you'll actually understand what I'm talking about. You don't have a vocabulary yet. You need some volume to be able to appreciate some of the stuff I want to work on you with. But people do two reps and they're like, oh, how is that? Well, it's like you know, the joke about, I've been to the gym three times this week. I still can't see my abs. <laughs> it's probably going to take a little bit longer. You know, you took 20 years to get out of shape. It's not going to be a week. It's not going to be 20 years if you're on the right path. It's going to be quicker than that. But you didn't get out of shape overnight. You're not going to get in shape overnight. So uh, we, we need to realize that, yeah, you've got to put in some work, man. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, and that's uh, and I think actually with the cardio stuff, that's one of the big things that people don't like. You know, and and I always when I see that people talk about boredom, all I can think is you're not trying hard enough. Because swimming, and, and I imagine rowing on an erg as well, is about the same. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and swimming, people are like, oh, you know, like you're just staring at the black line. I can honestly say when I was training for Ironman, I did not get bored swimming at once, right? Like you are so focused on hit my interval, hand goes like this, body position here, hit this turn. Like I've got something to concentrate on yeah. every single stroke of every single lap for four kilometers. So. Um, you know, the only thing I can think is, again, people are distracted by the voices. They need to focus on the task at hand. And I don't want to be all touchy-feely, but, you know, if they're a little bit more zen, a little bit more present in what they were doing, again, they'd probably find a much better result. Yes. And I, and I totally agree in regards to swimming. Uh, I, I did a, a couple of years ago, I did a half Ironman. And, um, oh, nice. Yeah. It, it was a lot of fun, but, I, you know, I, I got to the pool and uh, – and I was like, the guy's like, oh, do you, you know, you have swimming experience? I'm like, yeah, I grew up near the ocean. And I'm like, I, you know, I had been doing running and cycling. So I had some cardiovascular, but it's totally different. Yeah, it's not the same. Water. <laughs> no, no, it's totally different. So I like, I go, you know, 25 meters to the other end, 25 meters back. And I like pop my head up and I'm like sucking wind. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and he, hey, I'm, and you talked to Danny recently, Danny Sawaya? Yes, I did. Yep. Yeah, the, the world's chunkiest triathlete. Yeah, Danny's a great guy. Yeah, well, he, um, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to claim some of the credit for that. Like, so, because, you know, like you get in your little community and in the strong first thing, and, and it's no slight, but everyone's so focused on just be big, be strong. And again, I think maybe, you know, you guys are starting to limit your health. And if you look actually at some of the older master instructors, like Riff does some cardiovascular stuff, he rocks. Jeff Newport, actually, he's all concerned about original strength. He dropped some body weight because he realized actually, you know, it was impacting his health. Uh, you know, like there are some guys who've realized that that things weren't heading in the right direction, just lifting heavy all the time. And Danny, to his credit, I mean, he's a strong dude and he's he's naturally really strong. Um, but he said, I was just starting to feel shit. And I, I think it was a relief for him that someone actually said, hey, man, you know, it's okay to, to play around with different things. I mean, you're not a pro athlete and you should be enjoying it and it should be making you healthy and improving your life. It's been awesome to watch him even from, you know, miles away obviously, but to, to watch him talk about, oh, you know, I went for a bike ride, went for a run, you know, did this and, you know, he's getting ready for a, a bigger triathlon and I think it's super. Yeah, he just signed so, up for a 70.3 in, uh, I think, in the early spring, March, I think, two, 2017, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, if I didn't live so far away, I'd come and do it with him just to. That's just awesome. To have- that's awesome. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's. Um, I was. I would say I was probably on the opposite end of the spectrum. So I came out of college, and we did not do yeah, any yeah. any strength and conditioning work uh, during my my four years in college, and even after college, while I was coaching, um, just continued to do a lot of cardio work. And really, even with rowing, I would have thought rowing because on the. The continuum rowing is, has got to be much more towards the strength side than like running, for instance. Agreed. It is. Um, but we, the, the program that I attended, uh, the university, we didn't, we didn't do any kind of structured st- strength work. Is that um, because you've got such a limited amount of time as an NC, like as a college athlete, you know, like, you, like well, we just got to go for the sport, like, because we don't have spare time that we can spend in the gym with these kids. Um, no, I, 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 I know some coaches that, that do have their athletes going to the, the, uh, the weight room and, and work with the strength and conditioning staff. Um, I think it's more kind of up to the, the head coach and assistants and sort of the, the philosophy and how they kind of want to run, want to run the program, um, in that regard. So, so I, I came out and I was, I got a FMS screen done, um, and I was so, <laughs> like such a mess it was it was like, bad. I, yeah i mean i i've worked with a few rowers we had uh the year of the london olympics there was a so we would normally do um let's see it so southern hemisphere national championships select the team to go to northern hemisphere and do world championships and then they get a bit of a break and then start again and that year there was Southern Hemisphere National Champs, European season, Southern Hemisphere World Champs. 
So they rode like an extra 50% before they got a break and they're all falling to pieces. Cause, and you know, like, cause the stress is all on one side of the body, right? Yep. And in my head, I'm like, well, just let them row on the other side of the boat, but they don't do that. I mean, if you're, if you're a right-hand side rower, you're a right-hand side rower. And so you'll spend your whole career on one side of the boat getting all twisted up and, and messed up on one side. So I can imagine after a few years straight without any strength work to unwind it, you would have been creaking and groaning and oh, yeah. things weren't working properly. F- 15 plus years rowing port. And oh, wow. uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. I remember I got a FMS screen done and um, it was asymmetrical when I initially, when I first went through it, asymmetrical on the shoulder mobility and, um, active straight leg raise and trunk stability push up was like terrible. And but I uh, bet you could row the house down, right? What's that? I bet you could row the house down, right? Oh yeah. I mean, I was fit. I was I was a great example of you know fitness on top of dysfunction. Like I had. Well, but, 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 but that's the fitness industry. You can't stabilize. No problem. Come sit over here on this machine where we're going to take all stability requirements out, all motor control abilities. You're just going to sit there and push or pull or whatever on this thing. You don't have to deal with any of that force. You just push. The machine will do it all for you. And we've gotten to be experts at allowing people to create dysfunction and, and then stack, try to stack performance on top of it. Uh, and, and we wonder why the results aren't very good. Well, I mean, we're missing the underlying layers anyway, but the entire way we sell gyms, the equipment, all that stuff is based on allowing people to get away with that. Right, right. Yeah, and rowing. I mean, rowing. You just get, not saying you just sit still, but you understand what I mean. Like it's one motor pattern. You're locked in place. Uh, you know, f- from a, a movement perspective, it may be one of the worst sports. <coughs> yes, it's it's. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's pretty bad. It, uh, it regardless if you're doing sculling or, or sweep, um, it, it wreaks wreaks havoc on, on the body and. <laughs> I, I've written a couple articles for Row 2K and I came across, um, it was like a research paper, uh, a thesis that, that, uh, someone was doing for their PhD and they actually like demonstrated like the requirements in the boat mobility wise and range of motion wise are completely different than on the ergometer. Like you need way more hip, knee and ankle flexion in the boat versus way more trunk flexion on the earth. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So you, I mean, you're loading the body up completely differently. And so mm. what, what the, if you start to look at the trends of when athletes get injured, it's, it's right around peak times of when they're either transitioning into winter training and, and the water times going down and the erg starting to come up or they're going from the erg to the, to the boat or, yeah, right. you know what I mean? And, and then the other part is, is that the ergometers, they're only moving in a sagittal plane. Yeah, yeah, the boat's obviously rocking. Right. So you have you have a rotational component, you have the sagittal plane, and then you have a little bit of a, a frontal plane component with, with the, you know, uh, environment underneath of you. Mm. Um, so it's it's completely different loading of the of the uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, system. Yeah, you know, so, so our gym stand is like a seven-minute 2K – is that's the gold standard. So, 145. Uh, we got, nice. Yeah. And so, we got a couple of guys to get there. I was watching the single skulls at the Olympics. And I mean, the first day the rowing was on, and we had a girl win the skulls. I uh, can't remember her name now. Kim Brennan. But she wrote, yeah, but she rode about seven minutes. I was like, huh. That means that seven minute thing on the erg is complete crap. And, <laughs> and I said that to everyone at work, and they're like, why do you say that? I'm like, because there's no way even our best customers could row at the same pace as an elite rower. So, you know, let's not worry about comparing elite rowing times. We'll still keep our standard because it's, it's a good standard to have, but let's not try to compare it to what the elite people are doing because it's clearly not accurate. It doesn't transfer across like that. Yeah, the, it's going to be – the time on the water is going to be quite a bit different. I, I, I don't know her ergometer score, but I would – probably be willing to wager that she's definitely sub seven minutes. She's probably in the six forties, I would bet. So yeah. She's- well, yeah. I, I, and then I remember watching the men and the men were much faster and because the conditions were so rough, yep. you know, the men a bit heavier, a little bit stronger, so they can kind of punch their way through the conditions better. I mean, that was the, the first night the sculling was on. They were 
the, the girls were being pushed out of their lanes. Um, no yeah. one actually fell in, but there, there was one girl who ended up going sideways. Um, just, you know, because they, they could, I mean, Rio didn't do a very good job planning their, their rowing setup, I have to say. No, it was, it was pretty bad. Yeah. The, um, uh, I watched the, the women's, one of the heats, I think it was for the women's single race and it was just like a bathtub. Like they were just getting blown around and, and dealing with well, and, and some of the lanes were fine. Like if you're on the inside lanes because you were protected, the people on the outside lanes that were getting absolutely smashed. And then, you know, like even two boats in because they were kind of protected, just chipping along just fine. So, and particularly, you know, the last 500 where was where it got really rough. I'm like, you mean the part of the race where they, like the, the placings are decided. Like that, that's where everyone starts to kick it about the 500 meter mark, right? That's right. Last, yeah, last so, order of the race. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, t- I tell our customers, don't bother kicking with 200 meters to go. It's, it's too late, particularly on an erg. Like, you know, pace per 500 meters, you pick up three seconds. Well, you went one second faster when you, you kicked at 200 meters. Kick at 600 to go. Then, then you might make a difference to your time. Yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because it takes it takes a while. You got to build build into it, especially for that last quarter to to wind, yeah, it, well, wind it down. I just our goal is just go as hard as you can for as long as you can. And one of the things I and, and because you know you kind of have to teach people how to work hard, and yeah. sometimes their spirit of self preservation is too strong. They need to because you can't hurt yourself in the gym. Not on a not on a rower anyway. Um, you know, and, and I have to tell them, like, hey, it's okay. E- even if you like go absolutely all out, you leave nothing in the tank. What's going to happen? Like you're just going to collapse on the ground. That's you're not going to actually going to hurt yourself. You'll just be on the ground panting for breath. Like that's not that bad. And so we have to actually teach them that it's okay to blow up because now you know what, like how far you can go. You know where the edge is. We can push right up to it. So right. If if you blow up. Like my guy who's blown up at a seven twenty, but he got a seven twenty one nine. Well, okay, we know where the edge is. You know, now now we've got paces we can train at. We've got you know we we can structure everything around it. Otherwise, you're just guessing. You got to know where the line is. Yeah, and that's one of the things that makes the the ergometer um, so transparent. Is like you you have feedback every stroke, so it's like you know there's no hiding. It's just you there, so you know if you're on pace or you're not on pace, and like it, that. You, you learn to either really push yourself to your, your physical and mental limits or, or you don't. Whereas if you know, you're out running, even if you have a, a GPS and you're getting pace, it, it's, it's not this, it's not the same. Like it, it's a different kind of thing where it's like, it's kind that's, that's what you're looking at the entire time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and particularly, you know, the two Ks, it's painful. Um, <laughs> it is painful. But, well, it I mean, but for, for running, I mean, it's not like running a 2K. It's like running a 5K or, or something a little bit longer. There's right. a test often in, in a lot of like military and police and stuff. It's a mile and a half, so it's a 2.4K run. That's about the same sort of feeling. Um, and, and normal sort of standards is like around the 10 or 11 minute mark. As a standard for buds, it's like nine and a half minutes. Um, you know, so it's the same sort of feeling. Like you've got to get right to the edge. And then hold yourself there. So, and, and you know, again, teaching people that you know who come from a background of not getting their heart rate up, it's okay to to just because your heart rate doesn't go up doesn't mean you're going to die. You know, like that. Oh no, my heart's beating so fast. It's okay. You'll be fine. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. the, the, because you, you won't pass out. You won't die. What will happen is you'll just be forced to slow down, and right. your body will protect you. But you, if you can still talk, we're nowhere near that point yet. Um, and so we do, you know, when people come in, they will start with like two fifties and then, you know, like we'll gradually work them through that for a few workouts and then go to five hundreds and then there's, uh, two minutes. So, cause that's about 500. Uh, we do some IWT stuff. So you're talking about the, um, how to lift weights faster for maximum effect. So that's yep. the, the interval weight training is, is the two minute stuff that's in there. Um, then we look at things like 30-30s and, and a whole bunch of different interval things. Uh, so my favorite is, is 4 by 30 30 by 3 uh, with some rest between each one. It's actually based on a, on a cross-country ski workout that the Norwegians use, so it's, which is 6 by 30 30 by 3. Um, and then we build up to things like the 2K. 
And then after you've done that, you can go to something like a 5K. But, you know, like slowly, slowly just extending those, those goalposts out for people. And so the 5K now, my, about half my clients who've gone through this one particular program, they're, um, they're no longer scared of the rower. You know, we, we, like the 2K, they know it's going to hurt, but it's not like it's the longest they've ever had to have a high heart rate for this seven minutes or eight minutes or whatever. Now they're like, oh, yeah, I can do this. So, uh, you know, it's just about creating some more mental space for them so they can, uh, they, they can grow. And because, you know, again, people have this idea that their heart rate goes up for 10 reps or 20 reps or whatever, and they, um, then they get to stop. And this is when I was doing RKC, uh, you know, I, I realized that a bunch of people who thought they are in shape would die if we went for a run around the block. Um, you know, you do 10 swings, you're like, oh, that was good cardio conditioning. 20 seconds of work. You know, <laughs> what if I asked you to go for an hour? What now? Can you hold that heart rate for an hour? And the answer is in most people's cases, no. And so for the things I like, like a jiu-jitsu class is 90 minutes. You've got to be able to hold an elevated heart rate for 90 minutes. And I'm 45 and most of the guys are 25 to 30 years old. So I'm having to hold an elevated heart rate against guys half my age for 90 minutes. So do you think I need some cardio fitness? The answer is yeah. But the only way you get there is is – Push, push it out and push it out and push it out. So like with you, so I was a decent swim biker but not a good runner. And so when I started getting to running, I was like, well, I'll run for a minute and walk for four. And I'll run for two minutes and walk for three and run for three and walk for two. And slowly, 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 you build up and next thing you know, you're running for an hour. Right. And yeah. all of a sudden, when you're running for an hour a few days a week, you got fitness to burn for, compared to most people. And what a surprise, like when it comes to something competitive or even, you know, like a – God, it could be my, – my brother's gone to Thailand and Vietnam and stuff. Uh, they left this week. They're going to walk around Angkor Wat, which is like the big temples and stuff. You know, the movie Kickboxer with Van Damme? Yeah. And they filmed a lot of the scenes. Yeah, so it's, it's massive. It's kilometers and kilometers of temples and – but you walk. He'll be fine. His wife just ran a marathon, so she'll be a little bit beaten up. Her feet probably feel like someone took to him with a hammer. <laughs> but, um, well, that's marathons. Um, but, you know, they, they'll be fine getting around because they've got all this spare fitness. I mean, my brother runs like 50 kilometers a week. So he's got plenty of, of gas in the tank. His wife can run 40 if she needs to. So uh, walking around 15 kilometers or whatever, no problem. Whereas other people will do this walk and they'll be shot. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, it, I, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed reading your recent articles and that's actually I've been getting back to a point like over the last couple of years I addressed a lot of my own you know movement dysfunctions and cleared up some of the stuff that's that had been you know bothering me for a while and, and just build a foundation that wasn't there and now I'm just kind of getting back to the point where I feel good enough where I can kind of split my time and do you know two to three strength training sessions and two to three endurance sessions and i'm just doing um mostly i've been doing lower intensity but i'm racing this weekend at the head of the charles in boston so i've done a little bit of intensity work here i tested a 5k last month and then have been doing some short stuff like you know just a little bit of high intensity work in terms of minute on and then lots of 70 percent you know endurance work lower yeah. heart rate well, yeah, you know, it sounds like that's a pretty good long-term plan. You know, again, people get, uh, you know, they go along to, and I'll just use the things I've been associated with. Like, they go to FMS and they they become like a hundred percent corrective based. I'm like, well, no, that's not the purpose of FMS. Maybe for a period that's necessary, but the purpose of FMS is to eliminate risk. Then let's go train. Right. Right. Make sure you're safe. Then let's go train. The you know you look at uh, like RKC or SFG you know we're just going to focus on being strong well okay but just being strong there's some problems so and you know if you go down the straight endurance pathway just being fit that's got problems too if I just do yoga I just get flexible now I create too much movement I don't have enough strength to hold myself in the right positions I have no actual fitness that's a problem too we're not designed to do one thing. Like we got to where we are on the planet as, you know, like, like in charge of nature somehow. <laughs> by being, well, with an apex predator. Yeah. By being 
we're able to do a lot of things pretty good. We can't do anything really well. We don't swim that fast. We don't run that fast. We don't have fangs. We don't have any poison. Like We suck as far as predators go, but we do a lot of things pretty well. And so we look at our training and, and we think, you know, I, I can't figure out why I can't get any further. Well, hey, man, you weren't designed to be a specialist powerlifter. You weren't designed to be a specialist runner only. We were designed to do all of these things to varying degrees. So, you know, when, when you want the best result, and, and I often think the way we think about training for most people is square peg in round hole. So you look at human evolution. We are, you know, there's some tree swinging stuff. Uh, Scott Sonnen thinks club swinging is the first thing that humans really did. And so, so much of the body, like the slings and the diagonal that we work on, is based on uh, being able to swing a club. So he has his circular strength thing. Um, we're designed to walk and run aerobically. We're very powerful. Uh, we're designed to do some strength stuff. So, like, um, if you look at someone like, uh, like MoveNet or one the core, I mean, his movement stuff is pretty good. And the way they strength train is pretty clever. Um, but it's a whole bunch of stuff all tied together. It's not all one thing. And what a surprise, like, I mean, guys like Danny, for instance, and Danny is really built for powerlifting, like, way more so than me. Mm-hmm. But he was starting to get hurt. Even when I was doing Ironman, like by the end of it, I was like, yeah, my back's stiff. And, and I'm pretty – like swimming and riding for me are very comfortable. Running was kind of beating me up a bit. But, you know, like the moment you start focusing just on one thing, that's the moment you start having problems. Yep. And for most of us, uh, being mean to people, like it doesn't matter if you deadlifted 200 kilo, man. You're still shit. So, you know, all this focus, you know, the deadlift world record is like 450 kilo or something, right? So who cares that you deadlifted 200? You're not even halfway. Like if you're busting yourself for a four-hour marathon and thinking it's cool to run when you need a knee operation or the doctor told you you had to take some time off, you're an idiot. Like all you're doing is killing yourself for mediocrity. And parents are doing it to kids as well. I had a woman, uh, her daughter was a 220-800 runner. 15 years old. Anyone yeah, well, 220 is okay. And then you look at the, the under 15 world record. It's held by Mary Decker. So Mary Decker, I remember because Mary Decker was the one who got knocked over by Zola Bud at the 84 Olympics. And Zola Bud was famous because she was running barefoot. So Mary Decker, one of the best runners of all time, was the under 15 world record holder. She ran a 201. The actual world record for women at the moment is like a 158 or something. So this girl's 20-something seconds off what actually being fast is. She's had all kinds of lower leg injuries, all one after another. So like this is like the warning lights on the dash coming on saying, we need to seriously modify what we're doing. This body cannot cope with this. And they decide to run in this major championship race. Now the daughter's not running at all because she's just had major surgery. So you know, who cares about your 220, 800? Who cares about your 200 kilo deadlift? All you're doing is breaking yourself for the rest of your life possibly for mediocrity, it's not worth it. Wouldn't you be much better off chasing health first? And so you get that bottom of the pyramid. Get the eight hours sleep. Get the the you know go for a walk every day. Uh, eat some good food. And now once you've got all that in place, now we worry about how do you move. And so you know we want to re- remove all those movement restrictions, like you said. Now now we can start talking about the actual training. But we just worry about the performance side first. And even worse, we worry about the specific performance side for a lot of people first. Right. They're just not ready for it. Right. No, I I, uh, I, I love that and I appreciate it. And it's definitely something that's really resonated with me reading through your stuff. Uh, like I said, the, the recent blogs and um, catching some of your, your posts on uh, Instagram or Facebook because that's that's been a lot of my own personal journey. And it's it's so important. Like, that's what I've kind of identified. I'm like, you know, I'm 31. Like I want to be able to like move around really well when I'm like 50, 60 years old and, you know, not have, uh, had to have had like a knee, knee surgery or something and not be able to bend over to tie my shoes. Yeah. Cause that's you know? miserable, right? Like, and I, I have plenty of friends in that boat who are like, Oh yeah, my back hasn't been the same since I heard it when I was 30. Dude, you're 45. That was 15 years ago. You know, that's a third of your life spent nursing an injury. Like, or, or you could have just been a little bit smarter earlier on and, you know, you wouldn't have changed the rest of your life. And, and in a lot of cases, those guys are, they're pretty much 
you know, resigned to the couch now because their body can't cope with doing a lot of stuff. But all they were doing, I mean, I've talked to guys, white belts in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And so for people who don't know the belt system, it's white, blue, purple, brown, black. So white is at the very bottom. Guys talk about, oh, I need to cut weight for a tournament. No one fucking cares. (laughs) Right. No one cares if you win the state middleweight white belt title. Doesn't fucking matter. Don't cut weight for God's sake because, you know, like guys talk about, oh, I was just eating like a piece of lettuce and one of those small tins of tuna twice a day to make weight. You're an idiot. No one cares. Like, no one cares about your 200 kilo deadlift. No one, it's, it's, it's not worth wrecking yourself for. I understand it's good to have a training focus and to all that stuff, but it's not worth wrecking yourself long term for these mediocre goals. Way better just to be healthy and enjoy the training, sure. But don't destroy yourself for something that's such a small goal. Yes, yes, and I like the keeping the you know the eye on the long term uh, yeah. picture. That's, because that's it, even as an elite athlete, and you know, for whatever reason, if you hang an Olympic gold medal around your he- head, I'm kind of like, you know what? Whatever the price was, it was worth it. Like <laughs> I don't know why that is with me, but you, if you get an Olympic medal, do whatever you need to. But even if you win one of those. So average age of a medal winner is 28. Yep. That's both from London and Rio, 28 years old. You're going to spend a lot more time not competing than you are training to compete even at that level. So for the rest of us, and I realized when I turned 40, if my self-esteem and how I viewed myself, my mood, my happiness was based on my performance and my abilities physically, I was going to be pretty miserable for the next 40 years. Because no matter what, they're, they're in decline. I'm doing my best to fight that, but I can't do what I could do when I was 30. I'd love to be able to do. I'd love to be able to say I'm in the shape of my life. I'm in pretty good shape for a 45 year old, but I, I'm not in the best shape of my life. I'm far from it. Um, and th- there's no way you're going to get to be happy as a 40 plus year old if you are a broken and b still trying to like you know chase world titles or whatever. It's just not going to happen. Right. Right. So, my, oh, unless Stephen Redgrave, right? Oh man. Or well, you know, and, and <laughs> Tom, James Tompkins competed in his sixth yeah. Olympics. I think he was forty-five or yeah. forty-six. But, but those guys are. I mean, there's seven billion people on the planet, and there's two of them. Yeah, that's, that's a, a once in a generational kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's a one in three and a half billion person. That's not very good odds. It's you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So. My uh, my question is a little bit more direct because we've kind of we've talked about it a lot. So, how do you um, for yourself and then also for you know your your clients and stuff? How do you program so that they kind of try to address and get balance across you know um, the health benefits, cardiovascular strength, range of motion? You know, okay. So, so we do, uh, and I wish it was I could come up with a catchier thing than this. So all the numbers all lined up, but it's eight seven four three two. It's eight hours sleep a night, seven walks a week. So you have got to walk for an hour a day for for thirty minutes. It doesn't have to be like two hours, but at least thirty minutes. Uh, four good meals every day. Three cardiovascular training sessions of between thirty and ninety minutes, between one hundred twenty and one hundred fifty beats per minute. So this is cardiac output training. This is the type of training that's most beneficial for your heart in terms of longevity and health and all that kind of stuff, boosts the aerobic system. Um, And then you stretch twice as often as you strength train. So uh, Ian King, again, I mean, it's amazing how many times this guy turns up in one conversation. Uh, He said to me that he thought flexibility training was the last frontier of performance, and that was like 20 years ago. And again, you look at like FMS and – I don't know, Z Health, uh, Original Strength, all these kind of things. And they're all talking about movements as flexibility slash mobility, all kind of jumbled in together. Uh, Edo Portal is another good example. Um, And Ian had spotted it ages ago. But the reality is that, uh, so based on FMS stuff, 40% of people are going to have a tissue restriction, so a mobility problem when they walk in the door. So, you know, flip a coin. One in two chance they've got mobility problems. If they lift, the muscles are going to tighten up. They need to regain that length and regain normal motion if they lose it. Um, And most people just don't stretch enough. We're so restricted by our little cramped sitting position 
that most people need more stretching rather than less. So eight, seven, four, three, two. Once I've got that, if we get that, and so you know, often you know, my conversations with clients aren't about, hey, you know, I really think you should add five kilo to your deadlift. They're about, hey man, you look really tired today. How much sleep did you get last night? Most of my conversations are eight, seven, four, three, two based. Then we can get into the technical side of lifting and training, but let's face it, in most people's cases, because if you have a client who's doing eight, seven, four, three, two, it sounds like it's such a basic thing, but eight hours sleep a night, walk every day for 30 minutes, three cardiovascular sessions a week. So let's say you put them Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then, and you go, like in your case, I'm going to do three strength training sessions as well, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Now, I said you had to stretch twice as much as you train. So if you train for an hour in the gym, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you need to stretch for an hour on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So you've got six hours of stretching, three hours of cardio, three hours of strength training. You're up to 12 hours of physical activity a week plus half an hour of walking every day. It's another three and a half hours. You're up to 15 and a half hours of activity a week. Add in four good meals and eight hours of sleep a night. That is a stud client. Wow, that's awesome. But see, but it sounds like when you listen to it, you're like, oh, that's so basic. That's not, not, that's not no, a big thing. but that's a lot. It, that's a lot of you, that's 15 you and a half hours. You hit all that, you will be in shape. 100%. And you'll be lean and you'll be fit and you'll be healthy. You won't get sick. You will be a stud. But it sounds so simple. Then why aren't more people doing it, right? Can't package it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to put a package together and the, the, the first box to tick off is eight hours of sleep a night. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how are you going to sell that? Maybe if I come up with like some special high intensity pillow, or um, you know what I mean? Like, like because this is when I was talking to my mum today. Like, uh, we were joking about it. I was like, "Yeah, I need like a shake weight or something like that." Like, if I could, if I could come up with something stupid like that and sell out and make a billion dollars, I totally would. But I'm, I'm not creative like that. But I mean, the only way to sell sleep is you've either got to have a drug to sell, like a sleep supplement, right? Because there's right. money there. Right. Or you have to sell like the sleep equipment. So you need to sell, I don't know, like a special sleeping mattress or I don't know, uh, like in martial arts, things went, like it was ninjas in the 80s. And now it's like Krav Maga and MMA is kind of the trend. Um, in training terms, it'd be high intensity. You know, like it, you'd have to make it trend-based. But if you could do that, you could totally sell it. But I can't figure out how you make sleep high intensity. <laughs> well, let me know if you figure that one out. I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on your blog. <laughs> it's you know, and I, I joke with people. I mean, you know, everyone wants to talk about hardcore training. No one wants to talk about hardcore recovery. So the, yep. if you look at yep. the first three, those eight, seven, four. So sleeping has got a positive uh, effect on the nervous system. Obviously, helps settle the body down. Uh, really beneficial for for getting you out of that fight or flight response. Walking actually does the same thing, settles the nervous system, helps to de-stress the body. We know good nutrition does the same. So the 874, the first three things alone are all just about stress management and getting the body in a state where it can actually absorb training. The cardiovascular stuff is not excessive enough that because you can um, – you can basically rust your body when you, you over-oxygenate it. So too much aerobic activity is just as bad for you as too much anaerobic activity. But three hours a week isn't going to be too much. Um, and then mobility stuff, you can't hurt yourself stretching. That's ridiculous. Like all these ideas that you know stretching is bad for you and you shouldn't stretch and uh, absolute garbage. Um, especially when I know that nearly 50% of the people are suffering from some kind of mobility restriction just as they walk through the door. So but just the first things alone, 874. It's all about just be – healthy and, and and actually take the hardcore out of it or at least help you absorb the hardcore. But it's all recovery stuff. Right, right. Yeah, I like, I, I, that's great. The first three are all that uh, the lifestyle uh, yeah. p- pillar of the, the pyramid. Yeah, and, and because I, I think at the moment the pendulum has swung so far towards strength training, actually the thing I concentrate least on with people is and it's, it's not like we're not strength training i don't want that to sound like we don't do any we certainly do strength training but we're working on this other stuff constantly and what a surprise when you actually i mean it's like a car right like if the wheels aren't pointing in the same direction you got to keep dropping horsepower in there to make that thing go fast you got to overcome all that mechanical resistance when you get someone who's stressed out their body's all out of whack uh you know and, and you're like well you need to train more you need to train more you need to train more 
well, actually, if you just settle them down and get everything working right, you're going to find the amount of training you need is actually quite small. It's not one rep, but it's not like a hundred, like most people do. Like it, it's, and it's probably a lot closer to one than it is to a hundred. Yeah, yeah. Just doing doing the minimum effective dose and taking care of the the big stuff in terms of eating well, sleep, and really managing the stress. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome, awesome. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on uh, topics or anything that uh, you thought of um, during our conversation before we move into rapid fire questions? No, I think I think we're good for rapid fire. Awesome. Okay. All right. First question. Uh, given your your current uh, knowledge level and your life experiences. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 20 years ago? Oh, this is going to sound really arrogant. Um, You're right. As it turns out, when it comes to exercise, uh, I've been right way, way more often than I've been wrong about stuff. Uh, Things that like, I look at and go, I think this is the way to go. Five, six years later, the research will come out. And it'll prove it. Uh, I can think of things. I, I can look at stuff that's going on online and go, I was doing that six years ago, 10 years ago. You know, people are talking about it now. Um, I just got lucky. Or maybe, I, I don't know, because I'm isolated over here in Australia, I, I have to force myself to work through things and think better through things rather than rely on someone else to explain it to me. But uh, if I could go back, I'd, I'd say have even more confidence in what you're doing because you're right. Nice. Nice. Um if you had to pick one, what's your favorite strength training exercise? It's probably the get up. All right. Awesome. Uh, or pull ups. Get up or pull ups. They're both kind of pet exercises. Awesome. Uh, how has your training changed today compared to 20 years ago? Uh, sadly, I lift less weight. Um, my back, my back can't deal with the sort of loads I used to be able to lift. Um, other than that, not much. Uh, some of the distances are a little bit less. Uh, probably the biggest thing is, you know, so like, let's say you, you're 31, you said. Yes. Yeah. So you, you come to my gym, we train today. I can keep up with you today. Tomorrow you'll still be able to do it. I'll probably need a couple of days easy. So, uh, you know, if if we throw down in the gym, I can still keep up with anyone today. The thing is, they can probably do it again tomorrow. So, I I, I have to give myself a little bit more recovery. Uh, I noticed with jujitsu, I mean, I I train with these guys who are, you know, 10, 15 years younger than me, and some of them are able to train twice a day. I just, I can't. It's it's too much for me. So, I, I I can go hard now, but I need to go very easy tomorrow to make up for it. Sure. That makes sense. Um, What injuries or injury have you had and how did that uh, injury change your training? Oh man, I'm lucky. I tore my hamstring off the bone two weeks before my 30th birthday. Um, oh my God. I had to, yeah. But, uh, but again, this colored all of my ideas about rehab training and movement training and how to get things working properly. And so, you know, fast forward like five or six years when I started fooling around with FMS, I actually, cause you'd think something like that would be such a huge problem. I'm actually 3-3 three, three for active straight leg raise and always have been. So most people don't ever get back to like better than a dodgy two based on the FMS system. So I mean for people who don't know what that means, it means I still have the flexibility to lie on my back and point my damaged leg straight up in the air. 90 degrees, um, yes. yeah. Yeah, um, which most people can't even do on an uninjured leg. Uh, but because I really had to learn a lot about hips – ankles, like all the core, like all these things that, that are so important, it's allowed me to, to fix, because it's a big problem, it allowed me to fix a lot of smaller problems that people have. So it, it was actually quite a useful thing. I mean, athletically, you know, if I was a, if I was a good athlete, that would probably be in the end of uh, anything I did. Uh, I'm lucky jiu-jitsu, you get to lie on the ground and do, like it's, it's not even as explosive as wrestling or judo or something, so because uh, you lie on the ground, it really didn't affect it at all. Um but it, it colored everything afterwards. So, you know, as an average athlete, but a good coach, it, it was quite helpful. Wow. That's, you see, you learned a tremendous amount from that one. Yeah. And, you know, it, the only thing 
that it really makes a difference in is like if I wanted to sprint or something like that, like hill sprints, for instance, would wouldn't wouldn't be a problem to do, but it would be quite painful the next day. So um, you know, obviously for training, that means I don't do hill sprints. For instance, it's a dumb idea because I'd rather be able to walk properly the next day. Um, but so it, it, you know, other than top speed stuff where there's that that big hip extension quality, it doesn't affect anything. So it's really and because I'm not a pro sprinter or something, if I was like a sprinter jumper, it'd be or would have been a problem. But uh, for all the stuff I've done, like Ironman, running that slow doesn't affect it at all. Wow, uh, I was I was curious, but you answered my question right there. I was wondering if if it would yeah, well, caused... it's at low speed. Your adductor is a, a big hip extensor, so adductor magnus is is your third third or fourth most powerful hip extensor. So at low speed is certainly Ironman speed. Um, well, Ironman speed the way I do it anyway. Um, so, you know, like, like, like it, it's only at sprint speed that the hamstring becomes a, a big player. And, and even then people are only tearing hamstrings when they run because their glutes aren't tough enough to deal with what they're asking it to do. So, uh, I, I don't sprint, I don't compete in sprinting. It, it doesn't affect anything I do. Awesome. Uh, what is one thing that junior athletes, so like high school level, uh, should be doing more of to complement their training and their health. Stop specializing. Yeah. So, I mean, 85%, 85, 84, something like that percent of NFL players didn't specialize in one sport in high school and college. They were multi-sport athletes. Um, I was talking to, I ran an FMS workshop last weekend and we actually had the head physio for the Australian soccer team was here and he said that early specialization in soccer was actually destroying the kids and we are about 10 years behind what you see in the US. And again, we don't have the same, let's say, commercialization of junior sport that you guys have got. Like we don't have like the Parisi speed schools and all that kind of stuff. But all that stuff is destroying the kids. They're developing, let's call them adult compensations that you used to see in in mature elite sports people. So, you know, like the 30, 35-year-olds who'd been at it for a long time. Mm-hmm. They're turning up now in 12 to 15 year olds. You got kids in the US having Tommy John surgery before they finish high school. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, for God's sake, stop specializing. It's If you're good enough, you'll make it. I mean, I always tell, I know this is my 220, 800 girl. I told her father this story. I said, So Usain Bolt at 14 was playing cricket. And the coach said, You know, you say, my friend, you, you're not very good at this, but come on over here and let me introduce you to this athletics coach because you run pretty fast. And he's 14. He ends up at the under-15 world championships, right? So a year of specialized sprint training. And he made the final for the 200. He put his running spikes on the wrong feet because he was so flustered at the occasion, you know, this arm um, at the world championships. How do you think he did? I, well, did he still win? World record. <laughs> So shoes, on, I mean, if you've worn running speech, you know how tight they are. Like to put your shoes on the wrong feet, you would know, right? So he had his shoes on the wrong feet. I mean, it'd be like putting cycling shoes on the wrong feet in terms of how uncomfortable it would be and still ran a world record on a year of training. If you've got it, you've got it, man. They'll find you. You know, you don't need to specialize at 10 because no one's scouting for the majors at 10. They're going to scout at 18, 19, 20, like this. They don't care. If you've got it, you've got it. They'll find you. For God's sake, stay healthy because if you don't stay healthy, they won't find you. Because for every Tiger Woods, Andre Agassi, whatever, who who specialized at two or three, there's 10,000 kids lying broken on a heap who no longer want to play sport or can't play sport because of the injuries or they're so burnt out mentally they don't ever want to be involved in anything athletic ever again. It's just 9,999 kids for one successful one. Yeah, no, that's the truth. Yeah, did, um, our mutual friend Dan Mahoney and I, we talked about that uh, yeah. specifically related to baseball. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he was a good talent, right? Yep, yep, he was for sure. Um, okay, what's your best tip to improve recovery post-training session? Uh, the easiest one's eat. That's the first, eat, eat and then have a nap. Okay. Uh, if you want, if you're talking endurance people, um, the best thing I've seen research on is so Normatec MVP pants. You know the the big blow up pants. So if you had big like heavy legs after like a five hour ride or whatever, 
you stick your pants on, uh, but you don't ice the limbs that are in, in covered. You ice like the back of your neck or something. It's like an ice pack on the back of your neck and your your compression tights or even better, the MVP pants. Um, that's got the most positive effect on recovery. And then if you really want to soup it up, have a nap at the same time. Wow. Yeah, but for the base level, uh, good food and sleep. And and so uh, we would come in from like six-hour rides or uh, like big hikes in the hills and it's eat and shower and then you can do whatever you want. So, but you have to put in good quality. And, and you can, we actually had rules about, so after six hour rides, uh, when we we're doing Ironman, you can eat whatever you want because you've burnt so many calories, it doesn't really matter. But you must have the good quality food first. So, here's the, the good meal, you eat that. If you're still hungry, you can have chocolate, you can have chips, you can have whatever you want, but you must eat the good quality food first and you have to shower as well just because it helps clean the skin. Nice. Mm. All right, Andrew, what's your favorite meal? Kit Kat. Um, <laughs> and I'm a big fan of peanut M&Ms too. Um, favorite meal. Let's see. I do like pizza. Um, in terms of healthy, I like stir fries simply because it means you get a lot of vegetables. And this is uh, – I'm not single, but this is the single male in me speaking. There's only one thing to clean up. Right, right. <laughs> so, healthy with lots of vegetables is, is like what we eat most of. Um, and then if I'm having a cheat, it's pizza. Uh, and if I'm having junk, then it's, it's peanut M&M's or Kit Kat. There you go. Awesome. This is my sorted little secret. Very cool. I like, I like that. Uh, what's one book everyone should read? You mean for training? Uh, any, any, uh, topic or genre? Oh man, that's tricky. Uh, <laughs> one book everybody should read. I really like Jonathan Livingston Seagull, to be honest. Um, it's quite a multi-layered book on some layers it's about religion on other layers it's about self um, I just think it's a really good book about learning to always take a step forward and try to be a better person um, it's called, it's called it. Seagull? Jonathan Livingston Seagull yeah Okay. Yeah, it's a little book um, but it's just yeah, it's hard to explain. It, it, it's you know when I was a kid, so you know because I'm a little bit older than you, it was the sort of thing that uh, you know like older teens were reading, and because okay. I've got a brother, so uh, he he would have read it. But I, I've still got a copy of it in in my study. I, I, yeah, it's just yeah, it, it's a quick read. You'll be through it in a day. So it's really small. Awesome. Uh, final question. Um, well, you've actually already answered this multiple times, so I think I know what you're going to say. But who have you studied or um, do you currently study in your career to get better? Uh, Ian King was early on. Yep. Um, and then guys like Poliquin and Staley. Uh, and and I, I actually speak to Charles Staley a fair bit now, which is awesome for me because, I mean, this is a guy I've followed for a long, long time. So to sort of count him among my friends is pretty neat. Uh, then there's guys like Lee Burton locally. I have two physiotherapists who are super brains. One's Greg Day who works for SFMA, which is a clinical brand of functional movement. Another guy, Andrew Locke, who, uh, his business name is functional strength and rehabilitation. He is a spine genius, like on the same level as Stuart McGill. It's just that no one's heard about him yet. Um, and actually some stuff that he has come up with for bent spine mechanics and lifting. Stuart McGill was here not long ago. And uh, Andrew went and met with him and McGill agrees actually with some of his stuff on bed spine mechanics. So pretty neat to have McGill tick off your theories on a subject that no one else has even touched before. Uh, so I, I've got, I'm very lucky because I, I've got some, some very smart friends now. So uh, most of my research is actually done by, by you know, contacting one of my friends going, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And so most of these guys have got, super high level experience in if not one then many categories i mean greg day is um he's worked for exos all over the place so he's you know worked with olympic athletes at in a variety of countries and and levels and super smart guy that's awesome man that is uh that is quite the network you're able to reach out to well it, it's you know what like uh and, and very easy to be isolated in australia but that was one good thing about being in the rkc was that it actually really opened a lot of doors to uh, 
to meeting people and to, you know, because if you said to someone, oh, look, I'm a senior RKC or a master RKC, or, uh, they would instantly know what it was. And particularly when I got to master RKC, like, like everyone was like, oh, master RKC, okay. So, you know, we know for sure you know a fair bit about training and, and so you can straight away walk in and, and you're having a conversation as equals. Um, oh, and Joel Jamison, I forgot him. Okay. Definitely Joel Jamison because he's um, uh, got people to start thinking about, hey, this cardio stuff isn't BS. It, it's good for you. And he's got a big platform. So having a, a big name guy like that say, hey, you need some, some steady state stuff and it's actually really good for you. Um, so he, he's actually someone I, I um, he still pops up in my Facebook feed. So I always look at his stuff. Nice. Awesome. Um, thank you very much. This takes us uh, through the rapid fire and, uh, thank you for, for coming on. It's been a, a real treat. I was looking forward to this. Excellent. I'm glad, man. It's been a good chatting. I, um, uh, I think we've gone probably a bit longer than, than you were planning to, though, so I apologize for that. No, no, no. I, I usually block off at least uh, 90 minutes to two hours now. I, I like to kind of do longer episodes, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's all good. I'm, I'm glad we got to, to wrap a little bit back and forth. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, just, just hang on the line. Let me give you a proper goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this brand-new episode of the Leo Training Podcast. If you enjoyed this content, please take a moment of your time, head on over to iTunes, and drop in a five-star review. It really helps the show to grow. Or another option is to head on over to your favorite social media networks such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram and share this episode so that others may find the show. And please be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. Next week's guest will be senior SFG Pavel Masik. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.